But the issue of universal jurisdiction means different things to different people from their own national experiences. And one of the cases that called attention to uh, many Israelis was the case in which General Lerona Moog arrived in the Heathrow Airport on September 11th, 2005, and was told that he's going to be stopped and arrested uh, in response to a complaint made by two Palestinian NGOs, possibly others were involved in this as well, uh, which was a reflection of the practice of universal jurisdiction here in the UK. We're not here to have a, a discussion of the charges against General Amok, the allegations, I should say, against General Amok. We're not here to have a, a, a mock tribunal or discussion of that. But what we are, we thought would be interesting, would be um, to bring in General Amok to discuss, first of all, his experiences uh, in IDF service. Uh, and that gives us a little bit of perspective on the general issue of how it's being applied uh, to an Israeli officer. I just want to say personally that General Moe is one of the finest officers in the IDF, so it is in my, my own uh, familiarity with him and with what he has done and his efforts to uh, alleviate humanitarian conditions in the Gaza Strip. He was the uh, Southern Command commander in Israel. There are three major operational ground commands, Southern <coughs> and Northern Command, and his commander of Southern Command. Uh, and so I thought here we would have an opportunity to see him. It would be great if he could sit here in the UK and discuss this with us, but he's now in Washington, D.C., where uh, he has gone into the studio. He will be appearing before us from there. So, uh, the do you hear us clearly over there? Technology, technology works? Louder? Can you hear me? I hear you very loudly, and the picture is like in a movie theater. Okay. So I turn I stop. I turn the floor now over to you, Doron. So please, um, you may begin. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for hearing me. I'm uh, pleased and honored. Um, as you know, I'm prevented arriving to London due to the three arrest warrant that issue issued against me, ironically, September 11, 2005, when I landed in London for my own charity. Few words about my uh, personal background. I'm well known in Israel not only as a general and as a fighter, but also as a mouthpiece for the most severely disabled children in Israel. I took a mission on my shoulder to build a village uh, for autistic, disabled, the most severely disabled children in Israel. Phenomenal project, uh, one of its kind in the world. And I arrived to London, by the way, not for any military discussion, but uh, for this mission, for raising money in order to build a place or to build a future, a better future, for uh, the weakest members in, in our society. I'm very sensitive on uh, on this population, I had a son, he passed away unfortunately a year and a half ago at the age 23. He was autistic and uh, disabled. He, he has never spoke to me even one word, even then, Abba. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he gave me a lot of power to continue uh, fighting for this population. A uh, few words about my background as a military. Uh, I started my service in, uh, in a Paracubus Brigade as a soldier, uh, participated in many operations um, against terrorists, uh, protected my country by many ways. A Paracubus Company commander in the Yom Kippur War, I lost many of my friends. I also lost my brother in the Yom Kippur. After the Yom Kippur, I had the privilege to stop serving in any more in combat unit according to Israeli regulation. On the opposite, I decided to continue serving my country. And uh, due to my own brother was bleeding seven days in the field, I, I did my own oath to never ever leave a wounded soldier behind. Three years later, after the Yom, the Yom Kippur War, I was the first Israeli soldier to land in Entebbe, flying 
4,000 kilometers, landing 11 p.m. at night, and rescuing 105 Israelis that were kept as hostages. As you remember, uh, the, the night of the 3rd and 4th of July 1976. Later, many uh, operations as a commander, I was Gaza Strip Division commander, and between 2000 and 2003, I was the commander of the Israeli South Command. Now, some background on this reel, this particular reel. In this reel, between the end of between the end of September 2000 to 2003, I faced in Gaza more than 12,000 terrorist attacks. Between every day, between 20 to 30 terrorist attacks, ambush, sniping. Uh, side bombs uh, as well to Israeli settlement inside. In this period, all the terrorist attempts to get out from Gaza and attacking Israelis and Israeli cities outside of Gaza, all <coughs> the terrorist attempts. And we succeeded by uh, arranging a, a, a defensive shield around Gaza. I call it active defense system. Later on, it was adopted by the Israeli government, by the Israeli chief of staff, the Israeli minister of defense to the West Bank in order, in order to prevent the easy movement of terrorists from the West Bank to the state of Israel. Now in this period, between 2000 and 2003, I lost 84 people, 58 soldiers and 26 civilians <coughs> inside Gaza. At the same time, the state of Israel lost more than 800 citizens at the heartland of Israel. In Jerusalem, more than 150 were killed civilians, were killed by suicide bombing in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, in Netanya, all over the country. And more than 80 suicide bombers succeeded easily penetrating our cities and exploding themselves in an in innocent population. Um, and as I said, no even single terrorist succeeded to get inside the state of Israel from Gaza. We prevented any attempt by this defensive uh, array around Gaza, uh, a combination of high technology, uh, highly motivated soldiers, and also special regulation that uh, I decided and uh, on, on taking them in the field like um, a special buffer zone um, that enabling us to better view the terrain, the one kilometer perimeter near the fence and any movement of terrorists that getting toward the fence in order to cross and kill Israelis. Now, just, I, I want you to know that between 2000 and 2006, the state of Israel was attacked by 145 suicide bombers that succeeded in their mission and killed more than 1,000 Israelis. More than 1,000 Israelis. Um, by the way, among them five from my family that were killed in Maxim restaurant. Uh, my uncle Zeb Almog, um, Maxim restaurant, by the way, the suicide bombing was uh, in October 4, 2003, after I, I finished my term as a sergeant commander. Uh, a woman, supposedly pregnant, arrived to a restaurant, came between my uncle Zeb and his wife Ruti. Zeb Almog, by the way, by the way, was a, a legend in the Israeli Navy, a submarine commander. He trained in England. Uh, he came with the Libyan submarine from Portsmouth in 1968, a twin sister to the Dakar submarine that sank along the voyage. Uh, he was killed, his wife Ruti, Holocaust survivor, their son Moshe, 40. Almost every day, about between 10 to 20, intelligence alert of suicide bombing. Now what, what is intelligence alert of suicide bombing or terrorist attack? It's not a threat, it's not a title in newspaper. It's about knowing the answer for four questions. Who's the name? Who's the name of the terrorist? 
What is he willing to do? When and where? The moment you got the answer for this four question, you are able to do something in order to protect Israel and to prevent death of innocent, to prevent massacre. Um, as a matter of fact, in Gaza, we use two methods in order to protect Israel and it's about our right to defend ourselves. Now, by the way, I myself, as the commander of the South, I based on the military law that we inherited from the British mandate. Some of the, the, the British mandate, uh, manual field and uh, military law, still the same as we inherited uh, after the Brits left uh, Palestine in May 15, 1948. Now, we use two methods in order to protect our citizens. Number one, the active defense, as I described. Number two, targeted operation. What does it mean, targeted operation? Targeted operation, it's about ticking bomb. You know with this guy, he's <coughs> going to blow himself an innocent population. You know where he is now, and on his way, you target him. Many times, by the way, we did operation and arrested them, rest and, and endangering our soldiers' life by getting inside the Palestinian massive population area and arresting uh, some of the, of the terrorists on the move, on the way. Many other, in many other cases, we, we use the snipers or, or smart missiles in order to hit them. So, that's about uh, the, the background of uh, this period that I was the commander of the South. About uh, the legitimacy of our operation. First of all, we very much respect the international law. And I want you to know that we learn, we teach our soldiers from recruitment to uh, squad commanders, to officers' uh, courses, Pilots, admirals, we teach our soldiers the international <coughs> law. All over. Number one. Number two, we got officers, legal officers, lawyer by profession, integrated in the military. For instance, in 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 my uh, command, under my command was Lieutenant Colonel David Benjamin, that was by his profession a legal advisor a lawyer that uh, participated in, on every mission, on the preparation of the mission and the approval. On the chief of staff level, there was a general, a major general, Menachem Finkelstein, that participated in every uh, assemble, every planning of operation and approved. On the government level, the legal advisor at that time, Elia Kim Rubinstein, and they were, were all in the loop of decision making. So when I decided, for instance, to bulldoze houses and to create a security perimeter around the fence in Gaza, one kilometer security perimeter all over the Gaza Strip boundaries, so it was well approved by the chief of staff and by the Israeli government. The whole legal system were, 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 was deeply involved on the decision making on our operation in Gaza. And, and, uh, and the legal advisor were inside our staff. They were a part, an integral part of our staff. And um, in respect of the mass of suicide bombing and, and, and terrorist attacks in, in this year, what was done is uh, about the right to defend ourselves and protect our citizens and prevent killing uh, innocents. That's, uh, that's it, basically. Uh, some conclusions to my um, testimonies. Number one, <coughs> um, all my case is a part of uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and uh, some of it some of it was taken, some testimonies, some evidence that were found by leftists, by uh, Yeshgul, 
uh, movement and Palestinian human rights organization and uh, former Israeli lawyer living in London, Daniel Mahober, uh, all of them together issued this uh, proceeding, the arrest warrant against me, uh, trying to find a, a, a bridge in the international law, a lacuna in the international law, and bypass the Israeli legal system. Now the, 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 the state of Israel is, I think, I think, one of the most sophisticated, respectful legal system. And I think this legal system was well in the loop of uh, decision making. So, taking the universal uh, authority um, and, and using the structure of law in, in UK and asking the system to issue a response against Medina and Mok in a case of a specific territorial conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. It's not international water somewhere in the sea, not belonging to any state. That's an integral part of uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and there is a system to deal with it, and I don't see any superiority by the British law or the British system. With all my respect to UK, I don't see any superiority and any moral superiority to judge Major General Doron Mok or to judge the state of Israel. This is number one. Number two, I think this is a campaign, this is a, a, a part of campaign, not against Major General Doron Mok, but against the state of Israel. And, uh, and the state of Israel and the legitimacy of uh, the Israeli legal system all over. So, with all my respect to you, I think a, a part of the discussion is about should we continue dealing and discussing in London a case that the State of Israel needs to <coughs> discuss and of course need to be controlled by the international system and then the international society. This, this is fine, but it, it, it's a case that the State of Israel needs to continue dealing inside and I, I don't see a reason to deal uh, on the principal level to deal and, and, and in London in this case specifically. Um, it's a campaign against the state, of, the state of Israel and I think we need to block this lacuna and to improve the international law in this period. In this period we continue fighting against radical, ultra-radical, ultra-Islamic, uh, even in London. Uh, you remember, no need to, to tell you about July 7, uh, 2005, the bombing in, inside London, and uh, we, the westernized country, continue fighting against Islamist and, and extreme Islamism. And uh, I think the international law was uh, founded mainly for two conditions, a peace and a wartime. And when I say a wartime, it's not, uh, it's not the war on terrorism. A wartime, it's a full-scale war, like Second World War, or like uh, our 67 war, armies against armies, nations against nations. But when a nation fighting against Bin Laden cells all over, all of a sudden without any declaration in, uh, in September 11, some assets of, of America were attacked. All of a sudden, no one declared a war. But what is it? So what I'm saying right now, we need to elaborate, we need to improve the international law and to block lacunas and better protect ourselves and find a proportion on who is uh, justified and uh, and and uh, who is uh, who is right and who is wrong in this campaign against uh, extremism? For instance, just let you know, I mentioned the 145 suicide bombers attacked Israel and, and killed more than 1,000 Israelis. Is there even one lawsuit? One lawsuit? 
one arrest warrant against people behind that kill innocents. In Israel, at the state of Israel, at the heartland of, of Israel, there is no other law about even one arrest warrant against uh, the people behind the Islamists, the leaders of the, the Jihad and, and, the, and the radical Islam, that under their order, innocent people were killed in Israel. No, even I don't know, even one case that uh, they were accused and, and were called to international justice. So uh, this is uh, my testimony. For Thank you for listening. Uh, and if you want to ask, I would be privileged. Thank you. We have questions here. Yeah. I'm, uh, it's okay. We have questions here. Yeah. All right. Um, no, I'm not saying I recognize you. I'm saying we have questions that we submitted. Sorry, I don't hear you. I don't know. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Well, no, excuse yeah. me. We have I'm questions that we submitted. I haven't recognized you. I have submitted questions. Oh, um, it's a written question. Yeah. Uh, Doral, you describe. I have a number of questions that have been submitted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I have a number of questions that have been submitted, and I wanted to see whether we would have time to address them. You described multiple layers of legal involvement in military operations that you were involved with in the Gaza Strip. You described at the level of the Southern Command described the legal advice at the level of the chief of staff, and you described the uh, oversight of the civilian echelon, the legal advisor to the government at that time, uh, Eliakim Rubenstein. Three different levels of legal input. Um, do you recall times in which one of these levels of legal oversight told you not to conduct a military operation? Uh, in many cases, uh, first of all, I was involved with the all three levels. My attorney in, in, in my command, as I mentioned, and the, the, and the Major General Menachem Finkelstein on, on the level of Chief of Staff and, uh, and Eliakim Rubinstein, yeah, many times, many times uh, they said no to my appeal to take an action. They said no, they, well, we do not approve it. And uh, for instance, the, the, the Israeli Supreme Court discussed the deterrence on suicide bombers' families. The Israeli Supreme Court approved in the past destroying or bulldozing houses of uh, suicide bombers' families after the bombing. And I can, I can, for instance, I came to Eliakim Rubinstein and, and told him why after we lost people. Let's do it before we got the information. I can show you the scripts. So many times they say, no, we do not allow you to, to go and, and arrest buildings of families um, uh, behind suicide bombing uh, or suicide bomber on the, proper, on the preparation uh, in order to create some deterrent and some pressure on the family I don't, in, in order to prevent the suicide bomber continue on his way. Uh, we knew on, on many times that they couldn't launch suicide bombers, so that they used mortar, they used um, um, rockets. So we knew on the launchers houses, and I built uh, uh, Eliakim Rubinstein, for instance, on getting inside and, and in, in this campaign using uh, uh, our power to destroy houses before. They said no, and of course we obeyed. We didn't, we didn't uh, destroy houses before any approval. So all over, as you said, the multi-layers uh, involvement of a legal advisor, uh, we listened and we obeyed, uh, and and every action that was taken uh, was approved um, by the legal advisors. Follow-up question: Do you remember a single instance in your years in Central, in Southern Command, where the determination of the Israeli Supreme Court was ignored by the army? Never. The Israeli Supreme Court uh, uh, was dealing on uh, 
petition of every Palestinian. By the way, many times we give a petition right to Palestinian settlers living uh, in Gaza before we get inside and, and bulldoze and, and uh, knowing to tell you that uh, we use this method of bulldozing houses in order to protect Israeli settlers or protect soldiers in, in a place of friction. For instance, you got access to Gaza and on two sides of the axis you got uh, Muslim population living, some of them innocent, but in order to, to secure the movement, the traffic of the Israelis and the settlers, we ask the Chief of Staff and Ministry of Defense, we ask to bulldoze, let's say about 200 meters from this side and 200 meters from this side and compensate the owners of the building and we did it. And, and, uh, and the Israeli Supreme Court many times gave the petition right to the Palestinian settlers and they, they attended and, uh, and the process many times continued for one year and maybe more. But by the way, uh, the State of Israel right now continue facing a situation of kidnapped Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit. Gilad Shalit was kidnapped in the June 25, 2006. June 25, 2006. Now, he was taken by terrorists that, that dig a tunnel from a house 700 meters from the fence. And I, as a, as a sovereign commander, I asked to destroy this building. Now that, that uh, I don't remember if the Supreme Court, but uh, anyhow, uh, at bottom line, the, the, the order was not to destroy this house. Uh, according to the proceeding, we did not destroy this house. They used the house, they used, they used the greenery, and by the cover of the house, they dig the tunnel about uh, 800 <coughs> underneath, under the border. They came behind the Israeli troops, kidnapped the Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit, and it's still hot, hot issue between the State of Israel and Hamas by the medi meditation of uh, uh, mediation of, uh, of uh, the Egyptian. Um, they're trying to, to come between. Anyhow. Um, <coughs> that's, uh, that's the answer. We have one more question here. Why do you think this happened to you? I'm talking about what happened when you arrived in Heathrow back in 2005, especially in light of the fact that real criminals in the Arab-Israel conflict, like Hamas leaders and other terrorists, have never faced charges anywhere. I think this is something uh, of the discussion that you need to uh, to ask the, the forum, the respectful forum, there, why it's happened. It's a kind of, of uh, a campaign against the, the State of Israel. It's a kind of uh, anti-Semitic uh, campaign uh, trying to find a slot in the international law and, and use um, any platform, any platform to attack the State of Israel and uh, to attack uh, and to prove the illeg illegality of the state of, of Israel and the illegality of uh, the state of Israel actions in respect of uh, uh, the Palestinian and the Gaza and the West Bank. And by the way, if you go to uh, the Harvard University, University website, you can find a testimony of an officer Itchy Christ, Colonel Itchy Christ, who did a testimony, by the way, when Daniel Mappover came to lecture at Harvard University. I was also uh, a senior research fellow at Harvard. Later, when I, after I left, Daniel Mappover came to lecture at Harvard University on my crimes. Now, a Colonel Itchy Christ was uh, the, the doctor of the Southern Command. He gave a testimony how many times we took casualties, Palestinian casualties, to Israeli hospitals. How many times? Um, and in, in this war against the Palestinian territory. So I can tell you honestly, uh, I think that uh, we are very sensitive on human life. 
The targeted operation is moral. It's about trying to deal only with terrorists, not hitting innocent. It happened from time to time that we hit innocent. We apologize. Some, sometimes the Israeli government decided to compensate their family. But uh, basically, I think we, we have uh, the right, of course, to, to protect ourselves and our life. And, uh, and, and, and that's what we try to do. And uh, I think that our attitude, how to fight uh, the terrorism, is moral. And uh, we continue dealing with uh, some accusation, as, as we do today, some of them with no solid ground at all. This is a kind of, of uh, hypocr hypocrisy, no solid ground at all. So this is not the case. You know, when I need to today uh, to appear in front of you and give a testimony at the Ronald Morgan. By the way, a year ago, I was chosen by the Israeli Channel 2 television as the man of the year for my contribution to the Israel society. And uh, I'm known for my sensitivity to the wicked members in, in our society, as I told you. So, 